Good morning. My name is John Newman. I, I serve as the chairman of the elders here at GCC. And I wanted to tell you a few things about what's going on uh, with Pastor John and Tracy and uh, how things are going on next week when we reopen on February 7th. Uh, talked to John yesterday and he is doing well. I know that he really appreciates everybody's thoughts, prayers, calls, and food. Uh, they are both doing a lot better since they're having a chance to rest and relax and are looking forward to being back with us next Sunday. And on that note, uh, kind of a segue, the uh, elders met this past Tuesday and to in, in order to uh, get as many people here in the building that felt to feel comfortable worshiping in person, and we do feel that's an important thing for us to have is worship in person uh, with the body uh, of believers. And so next week, starting next week, February 7th, at 8.30 in the morning, we will have a mask mandatory service. So once you walk into the auditorium, you'll have a mask on, you'll keep it on until you get back into your vehicle uh, after you uh, leave the church building. Then 11, uh, 1115 service will be mask optional. So if you prefer not to wear a mask, come to that service. We wanted to try to get as many people to come to the service and thought that this would be the best way, best kind of compromise, uh, no matter what you believe as far as masks and their efficacy. Uh, so that's how we're going to approach it. Uh, we look forward to seeing as many of you as we can next Sunday, February 7th. Have a great day. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. Let's open up with a word of prayer to open our hearts and prepare our hearts for worship. Father, uh, I thank you. I thank you for who you are. And God, I pray for this time that we have um, every single Sunday. Uh, God, we, we've, we're so blessed. Uh, to be able to meet in, uh, in person and also have the ability to meet fully online uh, thanks to technology. Uh, so God, just we, we pray specifically for this time uh, for you just to speak to our hearts um, and that uh, you uh, remind us what it means uh, to worship you and that it's, uh, it's something very intentional. So uh, God, I love you and we love you and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
God loves you. Let's pray before we go to the service for, for the message. And God, I love you so much, and I thank you that you, you love me, that you love everyone who you created with this unfathomable uh, love. God, and without it, man, we'd, our world would, would be so much more lost than it is. Uh, so God, just speak through Scott, speak to our hearts. We, we want to learn about you. We want to learn about your love, what it means to look like you, uh, and to accept that love and, and to share that love with other people. So pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Mm, yes, God's love, it, it comes after us. He comes after us because he loves us. Good morning. Uh, glad that you're joining us again, just as Denver said. Uh, this is our third week online only, and I know that most of us are ready to get back together. Some of you have been online this whole time, and, and however we can come together is great. It's also my third week filling in for John. You heard a little update on him. He and Tracy are recovering and improving, and we just ask for continued prayers for rest and recovery for them. And I've noticed the last couple of weeks, it's been hard for me to be interactive because there's no one in this room, but I want to be as interactive as we possibly can online, at least in our thoughts. So I may ask some questions, and I'll just imagine that you guys are responding. So we'll do our best, the best that we can. So, so the first thought is, uh, have you ever lied? And, and I can imagine your hands going up right now in your living rooms, but have, have you lied? Have you told an untruth? Have you deceived someone before. Uh, I know that I have. How about this? Have you lied with your actions? Maybe not with your words, but with something that you did? Well, when I was a kid, I seemed like a pretty good kid, and I was for the most part, but I was also really good at deception. I was able to just lie with a straight face, and I got better and better at it. Well, I went through the season as a little boy where I didn't like to take a bath, Shocker, I know that's very common, uh, and typically I do like to take a bath, I do bathe, but, but at that time, I didn't like taking a bath. So I came up with a plan. I decided I was going to get sleepy a little before bath time, and, and then I would pretend to fall asleep when it was time to take a bath. Well, it, it didn't work the first couple of tries, but my parents made a mistake. They told me why it didn't work. So I just filed that away and was thinking, okay, we'll see, we'll see. It, they said, when you fall asleep, you actually breathe a little heavier and a, a little slower. I said, okay. So like I said, I filed that away. A couple of weeks later, I was like, let me try this again. So it, it was coming to bath time. I started kind of nodding off, getting a little sleepy. And then I pretended to fall asleep with a little bit more effect. I breathed heavier, a little bit louder. And my parents thought, oh, maybe he's actually asleep this time. And so I fooled them. I deceived them. I did this more than once. And I think either my parents eventually caught on to it or, like, I was okay taking a bath again. I don't know. But whatever it was, the deception worked. And it started a trend in my life that I found out I could get away with stuff by deceiving others. Well, that's not something that I'm proud of. I'm still really good at sarcasm today because of that. Uh, once again, not something I'm proud of, just part of who I am and, and kind of my history of deception. Don't worry, I'm not trying to deceive anyone today, but, but we're going to be looking at Jacob today. So I was thinking about my own deceptive heart and mind as we're looking at Jacob, this grandson of Abraham, and we're going to look at his part of the story in Genesis 35. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, you can, uh, but, but we see... Jacob's story as part of this bigger story that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. And, and he was this man of deception, it, but God loved him despite the fact that he was a lying cheat and that he was deceiving others and even deceiving himself in the process. And see, we live in this broken world that's broken by sin. It, from Adam's sin to our sin, we see the brokenness, and we see the effects of sin on the world. And we've seen that even just in this covering of Genesis the last couple of weeks. Going through our reading plan as I've been sharing with you guys on Sunday mornings. But what we see is also the early part of God's plan of redemption. 
We see how God called Abraham and started this conversation with Abraham. And then last week we looked at how God put Abraham to the test and it showed the trust that Abraham had developed for God. It also showed the trust that Isaac had developed for his father, Abraham. And then ultimately we've seen how Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise and the call and the covenant And he chooses to bless us and provide for us through Jesus. See, God is our provider, our Jehovah Jireh, and he calls us into a conversation and calls us to trust him. So in this passage in Genesis 35, we're going to see that despite Jacob's sin, God loved him. God protected him, and God changed his life. And it's the same for us today. God loves us despite our sin. He cares for us, and he wants us to have a new life in Christ. So before we get into Genesis 35, I just want to pray again uh, and ask God to speak into our hearts and to speak through me as we go through this passage. So Lord, thank you for calling us into a conversation. Thank you for providing for us. Help us to trust you and help us to see your love through your word and how you reach out to us and, and you leave the 99 and you come for us, Lord. Help us to see that today and know that and experience your love in Jesus' name. Amen. So Genesis 35, I'm going to read a few verses at a time and then stop and kind of dig a little bit deeper. And what I want us to see in these first three verses is that God's love is unconditional. So Genesis 35, verse 1, God said to Jacob, get up, go to Bethel and settle there. Build an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his family and all who are with him, Get rid of the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your clothes. We must get up and go to Bethel. I will build an altar there to the God who answered me in my day of distress. He has been with me everywhere I have gone. So we see that God told Jacob to to arise, to get up, and go to the place that he had met him before. And and that place is Bethel, which means the house of God. It's this place that he met Jacob when Jacob was on the run. He says, go back there and build an altar to me. And and this this isn't the first altar that we've talked about. We've talked about altars the last couple of weeks. and, And we see that these altars are places of worship and markers on that journey of faith that God's people were experiencing. And so Jacob said to his household, to his wives, his kids, his servants, he said, all right, turn away from your foreign gods, purify yourselves, cleanse yourselves, change your clothes, freshen up, get rid of anything that represents our old way, get rid of anything that represents those false gods that we've been worshiping. He said, we got to go, we got to get up, we're going, we're going to Bethel, and and we've had all these gods in our house, but now we're going to the house of God, we're going to meet the one true God. And he actually uses a generic name for God here. It just kind of that God that we choose to worship, whatever God that may be. And, and, and he says, but the thing is, this God was personal to Jacob. It's not just a God that we choose for our own personal well-being or for our own personal self. This God was actually personal. He was with Jacob, and he answered Jacob in his distress. See, the God that we're talking about here, he's relatable. But, but what was Jacob's actual relationship with this God? We'd have to look back a little bit, but it, I'm not sure the whole relationship between God and his promised people was always passed down very well. We can look throughout the Old Testament and see this. Each generation must choose whether or not to follow God, and hopefully parents and grandparents are passing their faith on. It's as true today as it was then. But here it almost seems like there was no passing on of faith in God from Isaac to Jacob. There was a passing on of blessing, but not necessarily a passing on of the blesser. So Jacob was born into this family of promise, the son of Isaac and grandson of Abraham. And each of these men were given a promise to become a great nation, through which all nations would be blessed. But Jacob was born this deceiver, and it actually sounds like deception was more of a family heritage than, than faith in God was. And so eventually this put Jacob on the run. 
And while running, he came to the spot and spent the night. And during the night, he had this dream of a stairway to heaven. And it had angels going up and coming down. And, and this is in Genesis 28. If you want to turn there with me, flip back a couple of pages or go back a couple of chapters on your app, whatever you're using for your Bible. But Genesis 28 is where the story of that Jacob's ladder, that stairway to heaven, comes from. I want to pick up in verse 13. He says, the Lord was standing there beside him. So while he's having this dream, the Lord is standing there beside him, saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. I will give you and your offspring the land on which you are lying. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out toward the west, the east, the north, and the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and and your offspring. So we've heard that before. We see it again here. Look, I am with you and, and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So God makes this promise, and, and we see that God showed up in Jacob's dream, and Jacob was aware of God as the God of his fathers. But I don't think he really knew God relationally here. And we see that even God did not approach Jacob saying, I am your God. He says, I'm the God of your father Abraham and Isaac. He approached him like a friend of his dad's, a friend of his granddad's. And so then we continue. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. So he's recognizing the Lord, Yahweh. And he says he was afraid and said, what an awesome place this is. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So that house of God, Bethel. And early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that was near his head and set, up, set it up as a marker. He poured oil on top of it and named the place Bethel, though previously it was called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, and this is interesting here. If God will be with me and watch over me during this journey I'm making, if he provides me with food to eat and clothing to wear, and if I return safely to my father's family, then... The Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a marker will be God's house, and I will give you a tenth of all that you have given me. So so what Jacob's doing here is he's actually putting a condition on God being his God. He's not saying, okay, God, you are my God. Protect me as I go, wherever I go, protect me. No, he's saying, look, if you want to be my God, then you do this and that and take care of me and bring me back here safely. You see that? Like, it's this whole idea of Jacob putting God to the test. Before we saw God put Abraham to the test, now Jacob is putting God to the test. And you know what? It's a good thing for Jacob that God loved him, not because of him, but because of God's own love, <laughs> and that it wasn't based on Jacob. See, God loves us and meets us where we are and calls us to himself. He doesn't wait until we have it all together. He doesn't say, okay, get this part of your life tidied up, clean this up, figure all this out, and then I will come and love you. No, he says, I love you the way you are. And I want to care for you, and I want to bless you. And we can see this. We heard it in the song that Denver sang, but also we can see this in Romans 5. Paul is writing to the church in Rome And and it's this young church, and they're far from kind of the center of the Christian world at the time, in in the midst of paganism. And he says, look, Romans chapter 5, verse 6, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person perhaps someone might even dare to die. In verse 8, but God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, God did all of his part. He took care of Jacob. When Jacob was only focused on himself, he protected Jacob when Jacob was not worth protecting. And Jacob had nothing to boast about. He was a lying, deceiving, cheating, play, he was playing favorites, living for himself. It doesn't really sound like a godly lifestyle because it wasn't. He was not a man of God, but he was a man that God loved. Sounds a lot like me and us. When I was lying and deceiving and misleading, when I was living for myself, trying to figure out my own way, Jesus said, okay, that's you, 
but look at what I've done for you. And, and, and realizing that he loved me not because of my goodness, but because he made me and wants me to know him, I realized that I was missing the mark and I was off target, but Jesus loved me so much to hit the target for me. And that's what God was doing for Jacob. That's what he offers each of us. It's a love that's not based on us. I still mess up. I still fall short. I still deceive, and it breaks my heart now. The only difference is instead of trying to get better at it, I try to get rid of that part of my life. I try to get rid of that old way of thinking and living. When God called Jacob back to Bethel, Jacob decided it was time for the God of his fathers to be his God. And so we see faith fades in the second and third generation. And sometimes it's because there's no surrendering to God. Sometimes it's this rejection of God altogether. Sometimes it's just accepting a belief system because that's what your parents believe. But Jacob had to accept God as his God. See, Jacob had seen his father favor his slightly older twin brother. And Esau was a man's man, and that's what Isaac liked. But Jacob was more of a mama's boy. And so he followed more the practices of his mother's family, worshiping false gods and and living a life of deception. We saw it in Isaac too, though. He was a deceiver at times. But God appears to Jacob and extends this promise of love. And and Jacob continued living in this sin and deception, but God continued to love him. He he continued to call Jacob and appear to him. While Jacob was still a sinner, God loved him and chose him. While we were still sinners, Christ loved us to die for us. That is unconditional love. And this unconditional love of God is, is powerful and protective. And we'll see that in the next few verses. Let's turn back to Genesis 25, or 35. Sorry. Genesis 35, picking up in verse 4. And then they gave Jacob all their foreign gods and their earrings, and Jacob hid them under the oak near Shechem. When they set out, a terror from God came over the cities around them, and they did not pursue Jacob's sons. So Jacob and all who were with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. Jacob built an altar there and called the place El Bethel because it was there that God had revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. So Jacob's household at this time was not a powerful people on their own. And they are actually, you have to go back to verse, or chapter 34 and see like, part of why Jacob was afraid of people pursuing his sons right now. Because they had deceived the whole community and killed some people for defiling their sister. But you can go back and read that, but we're not really on that right now. But we're just seeing how they were not a powerful people. It it was just this family and and those who worked for them. And and the people around them actually became afraid of them. People who at one point wanted to put an end to this family were now afraid of them because God put his fear in them to protect them in the journey put his fear in their enemies to protect them, the Israelites, Jacob's family. So God protected Jacob on the run from his brother. He protected Jacob when he ran from his father-in-law. He protected Jacob when he encountered his father-in-law again, when he encountered his brother again, because God's love is powerfully protective. And then Jacob decided his whole family needed to follow the Lord. He tells them to do this, and so they put away everything. They put away the things that were keeping them from, from serving him and following him. And God protected this family of promise. The Lord wasn't going to let anything keep them from experiencing his powerful, loving protection. They were young and vulnerable as a family, but God protected them. And, and we can see this again in Paul's words to the Romans. In this young, vulnerable church, In Romans 8, we see that Paul writes to encourage them in their faith and in their love. Romans 8, verse 31. You can go there if you want. Um, Romans 8, 31. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? 
Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. He pursues us. He cares for us even when we forget about him. When we are in distress and on the run, he loves us. Troubles may come, but he is our fortress always. Jesus never said we wouldn't have troubles. But he did say, don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. And I've experienced troubles. We all have. Some of us are going through struggles right now. And some of those I brought on myself. Some we bring on ourselves. Others are brought on by our circumstances. Sometimes my own troubles were brought on by my own lies to others or lies to myself. But God loves us through it all. He, he loves us and he leads us to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil because we are more than conquerors in him. He wraps us up in his powerful arms. When we are scared, he holds us. When we are hurting, he holds us. When we've lost our way, he comes and finds us and brings us to himself because his love is powerful and protective. And, and so because his love is unconditional and powerfully protective, his love is life-changing. So let's see that in, in these next few verses. We'll, we'll, we'll pick up in verse 9 in Genesis 35. God appeared to Jacob again after he returned from Padan Aram. I say that different every time I say it, I think. Um, and he blessed him, and God said to him, Your name is Jacob. You will no longer be named Jacob, but your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel, but God also said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation, indeed an assembly of nations, will come from you, and kings will descend from you. I will give you the land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac, and I will give the land to your future descendants. Then God withdrew from him in the place where he had spoken to him. And then Jacob set up a marker at the place where he had spoken to him, a stone marker, poured a drink offering on it, and anointed it with oil. Jacob named the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. So we see this changing of name for Jacob, and, and Jacob changing the name of the place where he met God. It, God showed up again to bless him. He, he, he blessed him again. He repeated his promise, repeated this covenant with Jacob. And, and we see he had to do it multiple times. He had to do it multiple times with Abraham also. How many times does God have to say something to us multiple times before we get it? How many times did you have to hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus, before you accepted him as your Savior? Maybe you haven't accepted yet. Maybe you're still hearing it and still not sure. Sometimes we just need to hear a message more than once for it to really sink in. Maybe you've been sharing this message with someone else. Maybe you've been trying to share faith with, with your kids, with a classmate, with a neighbor, a friend, a grandkid, and it's just not clicking. It, Keep sharing the truth and love. Don't stop. Because we're all on this journey to Christ, or we're on this journey in Christ. Jacob journeyed for some time before he submitted to God and allowed God to be his God. See, see God's God over all, but we also have to submit to him and accept that he is God. And we're all on that journey. On that journey, Jacob wrestled with God. He wrestled for a blessing to the point of having his hip injured. And we wrestle, we fight against God, but also God sometimes knocks us down or he takes us being knocked down to lift us up and see how much he loves us. Hearing that message over and over again until it finally clicks. Man, God really loves me. It's all part of that journey. And we see this is the second time that Jacob's name is no longer Jacob, but would be Israel. Instead of Jacob, this grasper, supplanter, deceiver, it would be Israel, one who strives or contends or wrestles with God. 
See, Jacob was stubborn, but God's love for him was even more stubborn, more relentless. And God protected him. And, and, And then God proclaimed himself. We see Jacob use that generic name for God, but God here shows up and he says, I am God Almighty, El Shaddai, all-powerful. He says, this is who I am. He says, be fruitful and multiply. This isn't the first time we've heard this. We heard it with Adam and Eve, we heard it with Noah, and now we see it again with Jacob. Be fruitful and multiply, increase and grow. And we start to see some of that increase. Abraham and Isaac didn't have many kids, but Jacob, he had... 12 sons. He's had 11 at this point and one's coming soon uh, a couple of chapters later. But during this time uh, they were growing and God continued to call this nation into existence out of this people. And and that nation is still known by the name Israel today. And and they've been through struggles but God continues to protect them because, because of his mighty hand El Shaddai. And God here says, kings will arise from you. They didn't have king, a king in their nation over their people for hundreds of years. But eventually the king of kings and lord of lords would arise from this family to be the king for all eternity. And as far as we know, Jacob didn't ask for his name to be changed. He didn't ask for a nation to come from him. He really didn't look beyond himself. He asked for a blessing, but it was all more selfish. But what eventually happened was that God would bring about a blessing that would change all of eternity through his family. And we can look back at Paul's words again, because it also, this change in Jacob changed the world. Romans 6 says, what should we say then, starting in verse 1? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can, he who die, how can we who die to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death? Then Romans 6, verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him in baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. See, Jacob's old way had gone. He was no longer one who had to take another's place. God had given him a place and and, and put him in a place to where he had this new name, He had a new life. He had a new purpose. He no longer had to fight and scratch and claw to be who he wanted to be. He could be the man that God made him to be. And for me, that that little deceptive boy who tricked his parents by pretending to sleep stands before you as one who who doesn't want to deceive. I don't want to lie. I want to tell the whole truth, and I want to see others set free by the truth of Jesus Christ. When we submit to Jesus we begin to live the best life that God has for us. We are free to bless others because it's not about us. And God meets us where we are and wants to live in and through us. So so where are you? Where are you on that journey to Christ or with Christ? Are you helping others in their journey? We are all called to live a new life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Not because of what we've done, but because of what he's done for us. And as disciples, we're called to be fruitful and multiply, bearing the fruit of the Spirit, multiplying faith from generation to generation, being a kingdom of priests as his disciples. And then, when we think about our mission here at Gwinnett Community Church, then we become disciples who exalt the Lord that loves unconditionally. And we encourage others, we empower hearts and minds to live for him, And we engage his world by sharing his life-changing love. See, Christ died for us while we were still living in sin. And he made us more than conquerors because nothing can separate us from his love. And because of that love, we can walk in newness of life. We can, instead of striving against God, strive with him for love and hope and peace and justice and unity Because God is El Shaddai, the God Almighty. His love is unconditional. His love is powerful and protective. And his love will change our lives for the better for all eternity. Let's trust him and pray. Lord, we thank you for your love. 
We thank you for your unconditional love that comes after us, that is powerfully protective, that guards our lives and, and brings us into a conversation with you, that calls us into a conversation that will change our lives that powerful, life-changing love that you offer. Let us not hold it to ourselves, but let us know you as our blesser and bless others with the love of Jesus Christ. Help us to do that as we go today and throughout our week and throughout our lives to extend your love and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch's treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen. Sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my shame that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in any no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from this reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, His wounds have paid my rent. pray as we close out in the service. And God, I thank you. I thank you that we get to experience the same love from you, the God who never changes, the same God as always, today and forever. As Jacob, we get to experience that love um, under the new covenant of Jesus. And that's just, it just blows my mind that you would come and, and die for me, for me, for everyone. Uh, God, let us, let, let us take that with us uh, as we go back into our lives today after this, this online service, back to work, or maybe we're, we're still at home into our relationships. God, let, let us take it with us. We love you and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We'll see you guys next week.